Good afternoon. Um, hello to everyone here in person and to everyone tuning in online. A special welcome to the medical students. We're so proud of you. So for the last two years, we've had an excess of 1,000 more applicants per class than two years prior. As you, as you didn't hear, because you're outside the room, you all competed with more than 6,000 people for these 145 seats. So why are so many more people interested in a career in medicine? To me, it's clear that the COVID pandemic has realized an epiphany. What we do in our academic medical centers and our medical schools matter. A life of service embracing humanism, medicine, and science matters. This also tells us how, it is, how competitive it is that you are all sitting here today. You and your supporting family and friends are special. In fact, you're elite. As you'll hear me say over and over, over the next few years, I strive for our public university school of medicine to be elite in every way, but never elitist. You all have grit and resilience, discipline, intelligence, but you're also humanists, confronting challenge with integrity, grace, and compassion. You do not simply accept this current world order, but want to step into the trenches and correct healthcare inequity and fight for social justice. And above all, you want to make a difference and make a positive impact on our imperfect world. To paraphrase Walter Isaacson, the author of Steve Jobs' biography, you're here today to put a dent in the universe. These are the values that we look for in our students at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the transformative experience ahead of you. We touched on this briefly Monday. What are the generational challenges that you are gonna face serving on the front lines of our academic medical center in the next few years and for your career? Generational challenges. When I think of generational challenges, I think of the paradigm changing effect of the HIV AIDS epidemic when I started medical school in Miami in 1991. Uh, sitting in seats like those. Miami was at the epicenter of the pandemic. The disease targeted an incredibly vulnerable and stigmatized population, men who have sex with men and Haitian immigrants. I cannot understate the broad stigmatization of our patients, with many physicians at that time even refusing to take care of patients with AIDS. There was real fear among the healthcare community, mostly driven by a lack of knowledge of transmission and limited therapies reminiscent of the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. As a student, I had three needle sticks. It was terrifying. There was no cure for the disease, and we knew so little about real exposure risks at that time. You'd be surprised to know that in those days, there wasn't latex gloves outside of our patients' rooms. But then something amazing happened. We witnessed a triumph of enlightenment, compassion, and science over a horrible disease. Advances in epidemiology helped us understand the real risk of transmission. The cause of AIDS was discovered, a novel retrovirus that infects and kills our immune T cells, with major discoveries by our own Dr. Robert Gallo. A critical virulence factor called the protease enzyme was characterized, and structure function studies allowed for highly successful therapeutic targeting of the protease, one of the first highly potent antiviral therapies. Myriad phase one to phase three trials were conducted, which advanced discovery to patients, and major public health interventions embraced in a bipartisan manner brought these therapies to patients. These advances were carried out even in the poorest nations through the PEPFAR program, which was our government's effort to combat HIV, and the largest global health program devoted to a single disease, saving millions and millions of lives. So what are your generational challenges? Number one, Ebola, influenza, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that caused COVID-19, and now monkeypox, have made it abundantly clear that we live in a warming 
overpopulated, highly connected world of emerging pathogens. In addition to these zoonotic infections, which are viruses that jump from animals to humans, we have the rapid emergence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. You will be physicians and scientists at the front lines confronting these challenges at the scientific bench and the bedside and in direct patient care and policy. Two, climate medicine. This is an entirely new field that you'll create. Three, the aging epidemic. For the first time in the history of humanity, three years ago, two lines crossed. The number of people worldwide that are over 65 is more than the number of people under five. You're going to have to deliver new ways of caring for this vulnerable aging population. The cardiovascular and metabolic effects of the Western diet. This is driving epidemics of weight gain and diabetes nationally, often referred to the to is the obesity epidemic. This is having a similar impact to that of cigarette smoking after World War II. Five, the addiction epidemic in all its devastating forms. Six, the awesome challenge and opportunity surrounding computation, big data, information technology. These technologies are disrupting and changing the practice and delivery of medicine overnight. And finally, the COVID-19 pandemic is wreaking havoc in medicine today. After all major pandemics, for example, the 1918 influenza pandemic, there are classic waves of secondary disruptions, economic disruptions which today are creating major nursing shortages in our hospitals, waves of other diseases that have been neglected, like broad childhood vaccination or cancer screening, and then mental health challenges overdoses, suicides, and gun violence affecting patients and health care givers. In Baltimore, we've suffered more than 700 shootings and 300 homicides. Each of these individuals has a name, has dreams, has a mother that loves them who will never recover from that loss. Nationally, for the first time this last year, in the history of America, more children died of gunshot wounds than, than automobile accidents. So what's the emotional toll for healthcare givers confronting these challenges? I was deeply moved by a perspective that was written by, written by Jacqueline Heilman, a surgical resident at Jefferson Health in Philadelphia and published last year in, in the summer in the New England Journal of Medicine. In Philadelphia, they've had more than twice the shootings and deaths that we've seen in Baltimore with 500 homicides, reflecting a 50% increase in shootings since before the COVID-19 pandemic. She tells the story of a boy brought into the trauma bay with a gunshot wound to the chest, still conscious and crying, help me, help me. And she watched him stop moving, saying to herself silently, don't leave, don't die, we're here. But they couldn't stop the bleeding. He had an 8-centimeter hole through the right atrium and a 10-centimeter hole through the posterior inferior vena cava. 10 centimeters is the span of my, my hand. She felt inadequate. As a surgeon, she was supposed to be able to stop the bleeding. She left that night to the locker room and noticed she was soaked in blood to the skin. She dry, drove home and called her sister for c consolation. And I want to share her direct words that she wrote because they're so eloquent. She wrote, over the course of the six-week rotation, I was involved in seven emergency thoracotomies in patients with gunshot wounds. It was difficult, but over time I found peace in the quiet after each procedure concluded. I gently closed the patient's empty eyes, covered their bodies, and sutured. Somehow, in making that closure perfect, while I thought about their two short lives and the loved ones I left behind, I felt that I was honoring the victims. Looking back now, I think that maybe in choosing to take on the task of approximating the skin, I was really trying to put myself back together. I had been changed by what I'd seen, and I knew it. I spent time coping outside of work by painting a picture of that first boy. I let myself feel the pain again with each stroke of scarlet pain, paint across his body. I wanted others to know about these violent deaths. I wanted people to know what I'd gone through what I'd seen, I wanted them to understand it on a deeper level than the statistics that they read in the newspapers. As I attempted to tell people around me, however, I realized it was too heavy, too painful, 
It made them uncomfortable. My brother, an army ranger who was recently returning from deployment overseas, pulled me aside and he said to me, we signed up for jobs where we see horrific things so that those we love don't have to see them. And then she continues, later I recounted the gory details of my rotation to one of my attendings, a senior trauma surgeon, explaining how angry and frustrated I was. This is not what I signed up for, I told him. And he answered, yes, you did, he assured me. You just didn't know it. This is a calling. <laughs> These are your generational challenges now as servant leaders. We are really going to need your youth, vigor, your dedication to learning and self-improvement, your innovation, and above all, teamwork and leadership to tackle these great generational challenges. And when those days are hard, and they will be hard, you're going to be part of our family. And as I shared with you earlier this week, we hope you're going to work hard to embrace your vulnerability and ask for help and support from me, from us, for your family, from your friends. We're all supporters in this mission that you will lead. So in the final minute, let me talk about the symbolism of the white coat you're about to wear. So to me, the, the white coat symbolizes a calling. A calling is more than a job. It's a sacred embrace of service, optimism, and humanism. We will feel and experience and do everything we can to make that positive dent in the universe. Embarking on a career in medicine can allow a person to fully engage humanity in the most ennobling ways, drawing on the human humanities, drawing on sciences and even business. Donning your white coat symbolically indicates your entrance into a sacred and ancient fraternity that will mark the rest of your lives in a way that no other occupation can. And for the parents, I spoke to some of you over there earlier, I've probably given you a heart attack and uh, luckily the hospital's down the street, and I apologize. <laughs> I also have kids. I have a 17 to 19 to 21 year old. They change their age every year to confuse me. Um, so I know how passionately we love our kids. Kids, sorry. And we want to show them love and support with every ounce of our beings. And while we're never gonna stop nurturing them, we also must let them go. I assure you they will change, but they're always going to, to, to maintain those values that we'll model and that you've always modeled for them. So I think as parents, we have to understand that they will now largely carry this weight of experience with their new peers and mentors. They'll have to learn to understand real consequence in an imperfect world. So my advice is hold tight and let them go. They're now for the ages. And to our medical students, who I hope have a deeper understanding of the calling of the white coat, Godspeed on your rarefied and consequential journey as servant leaders. <laughs>